Hey there, everyone. It's episode 56 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best conversations about the martial arts, like today's episode, all about martial arts conditioning and strength training. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but I'm better known as your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, in case you don't know, makes the world's best sparring gear and some awesome apparel and accessories for your traditional martial artists out there. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you can learn more about them over on our website, whistlekick.com. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes, and a lot more are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Today's episode also has a full transcript with photos, videos, and links over on the website. And while you're over there, go ahead and sign up for our newsletter. We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests. Today we're going to talk about martial arts conditioning, physical training. We'll dig into the principles behind your strength and your cardiovascular fitness and how they affect your martial arts training, competition, and overall life. Now, I'm a huge proponent of getting the world to see martial artists as athletes. There are amazing athletes in the worldwide martial arts community, individuals that push the boundaries of what's physically possible. These individuals and their influence can be seen in television and movies, on stage and competitions, and elsewhere. They're incredible. The rest of us, while we may not be as dramatic or publicly visible, can be just as incredible. One of the greatest disconnects, however, and it's come up on this show before, is that martial artists do not tend to train like athletes. Most of us pursue martial arts as a hobby, and that's okay. One of my favorite sayings is that martial arts can be as much or as little as you want it to be. Martial arts is a physical discipline, yes, but it's ultimately about self-improvement. For many people, their physical abilities start to get in the way of their self-improvement. Now, this can be a sensitive subject, so I need to choose my words carefully. I want to apologize in advance if anyone is hurt or offended by this episode. I've seen a number of people gain the confidence to take control of their bodies through martial arts training. I find that to be wonderful. I have also seen, and this is less wonderful, many people who are hindered by their physical body. Now, I'm not talking about someone born with a challenge or someone that develops a challenge later in life. I'm talking about the need for increased strength, flexibility, or cardiovascular fitness. I genuinely believe that a structured fitness program benefits everyone. Unless you're lucky enough to train in the martial arts three or more days per week, and your class dedicates 30 minutes or more to that manner of training, it's unlikely that you'll receive everything you need from your time in class. I was working with some students the other day as they prepared for an upcoming rank testing. I was trying to inspire them when I had a realization. And I shared this with them. I've never known someone to earn a black belt that only trained during class time. In this context, I'm not only referring to techniques and forms, but time spent improving fitness. I think the benefits are obvious. If you're stronger, faster, and more flexible, and can train longer, your martial arts skills improve faster. In fact, I'd argue that some people will reach a point where their physical fitness prohibits them from progressing further. That doesn't mean the self-development aspect of martial arts are stopped, though. You might think that I'm saying all this in a very gentle way to avoid being direct in calling out overweight martial artists. That's actually not true. I have known exceptional martial artists that were quite overweight, and not only did some of them hit like a ton of bricks, some of them were exceptionally fast. I think there are a lot of health and fitness reasons that would encourage someone to lose weight, but that decision is their choice. I'll be a bit more direct here. I'm talking about individuals that can't do 10 push-ups, but they've been training for years. Someone who can't complete a form with intensity without being winded and bending over. These people could be so much better if they made fitness something they worked towards. But enough about the reasons why. At this point, you'll likely agree with me, or you've turned off the episode entirely. Let's talk about the different elements to fitness. I'm going to break it down into three components. Strength, cardiovascular, and flexibility. Strength is the ability for the muscles to produce force. If you're stronger, you can hit harder. Sure, that's obvious. But you can also jump higher or farther. It is muscle that moves your body, so it's more muscle that moves your body faster. If you're familiar with the difference between fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fiber, you might be ready for me to launch into a discussion about that. I'm not going to because it's a bit academic for the way we try to operate these episodes. I'm going to make some generalizations here, but it's true that there are different kinds of muscle fibers, and some make you punch hard and some make you punch fast. But in martial arts, we're generally concerned with power more than the raw components, strength and speed. There are times when a technique's strength matters more than the speed, and vice versa, but 
Usually, if we're considering overall time training, we're concerned with putting the two together. Since that is the case, developing either fast or slow twitch muscles helps us. There are lots of methods for developing strength, but most of them come back to a very simple principle. Ask the muscle to do more than it is used to, and it will adapt. If you do 10 push-ups at a time every day, your body adapts to that. You have the physical capacity to do those 10 push-ups. But what if you suddenly do 15 push-ups? You're likely to experience some discomfort, maybe soreness. But if you routinely increase your 10 push-ups to 15 push-ups, your body will adapt to that. Depending on your body type, diet, and a number of other factors, your muscles may grow in physical size, or they may grow in the efficiency. They will grow, however, and you're going to reap the benefits of that. Cardiovascular fitness is the ability of the body to process oxygen and the waste products created by the muscles while they work. When you're out of breath, it's a sign that these processes need to work better to do the work you're asking them to do. But here's the beautiful part. These are all muscles too. We can work them and they can improve. It's still adaptation. If you also do 60 second sparring rounds, you're likely to get more tired with each passing round. That's natural and it's expected. The more 60 second rounds you do, the more your body will adapt to that time frame. the more efficient you'll be. Flexibility too is an issue of adaptation. If you spend your day sitting in a chair, you probably can't kick above your head, at least not without some work. Routinely convincing your body to work, to stretch rather, to the edges of comfort will create adaptation over time. That's all a very simple explanation of fitness and that's intentional. I could talk about these subjects for a long time because there's something I'm familiar with and really interested in. If you find them interesting, I'd encourage you to learn more. For many of you though, you just want to know the next part, how to improve. There's a problem with the way most martial artists handle fitness. It's infrequent, it's inconsistent, and it doesn't take into account all of the things we know about the science of the body. When many schools train cardiovascular fitness, for example, they're training something at a moderate pace. That can be great for weight loss and heart health, but it doesn't do a good job of preparing someone for something as intense as a sparring match. If you want to force the body to adapt to that sort of environment, you have to give the body a similar stimulus. In other words, if you want to keep from getting gassed during a sparring match, you have to train at that same intensity routinely. I'm going to offer some suggestions on drills and movements that can be used now to improve your fitness. You might be familiar with some of them, others may be completely new. We'll post some photos and videos over on the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and you can check those out over there. Flexibility is the easiest to talk about. To improve flexibility, we push our muscles to the point of discomfort, but we need to do it gently. I'm a huge fan of ballistic stretching, sometimes called dynamic stretching. A lot of martial arts schools get this right. It's the bouncing kind of stretching, the kind that for years science tried to tell us wasn't right, but a lot of us in the martial arts community knew, no, this stuff actually works, and the science over the last few years has supported that. A great example of this type of stretching is leg raises or leg rises, called different things in different schools, basically holding your leg straight and bringing it up as far as you can. The place where most of us fall down with this technique has to do with warming up. Attempting to stretch a cold muscle is a terrible idea, and you've likely heard someone tell you to do just that before you work out. And it's true, you should stretch before you work out, but the missing piece, the thing you shouldn't do, is to fail to get your muscles warmed up before you stretch. There are a number of movements that you can do that will get your body warm and not risk injury. Unfortunately, it's not the same list for everyone because different people have injuries and different things that are not easy for them to do. Jumping jacks are a good movement. Push-ups, sit-ups, squats, plank holds. These are examples of simple body weight movements that will warm you up. I strongly recommend doing those or any other movement that you know you can do safely even when your muscles are cold. Do enough of them to see the beginning of a sweat buildup, you know, just when you're getting warm, and then you should be safe to start your ballistic stretching. I like doing sets of 10 repetitions on ballistic stretches. Each repetition should get progressively faster and closer to the boundary of what is a safe stretch for you. Notice that in everything I'm talking about here, you need to know yourself and your body. And if any of this doesn't make sense, please do not guess. Seek out an expert for advice. That might be your martial arts instructor, might be a physical therapist, personal trainer, there are a lot of options out there. 
Now, over time, ballistic stretching will create permanent change in the muscle, but it is also a really great fast way and probably the best way I found to increase flexibility on the short term. Say it another way, ballistic stretching at the beginning of a martial arts class, when done properly, loosens you up well for the rest of the class. Let's move on to strength. In the context of a martial arts class, we only have a few paths our body can travel to create strength. I'm a big fan of push-ups, planks, squats, and lunges. And there are lots of ways to mix those up so you can get some variety. Lunging front kicks, where you start from a position with a single knee on the floor, is a great drill. So if you're not familiar with this, from the start, with your knee down, you're going to stand up and throw a front kick with the leg that was on the ground, the knee touching the ground. And then you just put that leg back down. Don't smash your knee on the ground or anything like that. That's going to hurt, cause some damage. And doing 10 of those in a row is surprisingly challenging for most people. If you can do 25 on a side, you're doing really well. One note about lunges, front stances, squats, anything like that where you're bending down. You want to be really careful about the knee coming too far out over your toes. Ideally, your shin bone, your tibia, if you want to be technical here, should be as close to vertical as you can get it. If it leans too far out over the toes, especially if you're pushing off on that foot, you can cause some damage. Your knee wasn't meant to, to generate force in that way. Um, now, I'm not saying to ignore what your instructors tell you about keeping your knee out over your toes if you're in a school that teaches that, because that's still really close to vertical. It's the exaggerated lean forward where your heel comes up that you want to avoid. Squats and jumping squats, I mentioned those before. Those are great examples for developing not only strength, but power. Try adding a jump to the lunging kicks I mentioned. Great drills. Push-ups are probably the single best exercise for a martial artist, and that's probably why most martial arts schools do so many of them. And they, the reason they're so great is they work a lot of your body. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into push-ups here since there are a ton of great push-up videos out there. We'll find a good one, and we'll link to it over on the website so you can check it out. But there are two things I want to mention about push-ups. Some of you may know that we spent 18 months running a 60-second push-up challenge at a lot of the martial arts events that we exhibited at. And during that time, I got to learn a lot about push-ups and the mistakes people make with them. The first mistake, and this you really want to watch out for, is your elbows coming too far out to the side. A lot of people do this because it recruits more of the large muscles in your back, so it makes push-ups easier, especially if your chest and your triceps aren't really strong. The problem, though, with that position is that your body isn't designed to do it. And if you don't believe me, ask someone to try this. Have anybody, don't tell them what you're doing, go up to a wall or a car or any vertical object and ask them to push on it. And their elbows will not flare out to the side. They'll keep them pretty close to their body. Now, over time, this position is actually going to wreck your rotator cuff or some of the other muscles back around your shoulder blade. And I've seen it happen. I've even seen it happen in really young children. And one of the easiest ways to think about your push-ups to prevent this from happening is to keep your index finger, your pointer finger, pointed straight forward while you do your push-ups. You can't do that and keep your elbows too far out to the side, at least not without really trying to do it. Now, the second piece on push-ups is more of a style item. I see a lot of people that are used to doing push-ups go only a few inches, you know, just dropping down a few inches. And that's really a shame because there's no other exercise that I can think of that better builds strength and power for punching. So I'm going to strongly urge you that you do all of your push-ups full range of motion. That means chest to the ground, all the way up at the top. And yeah, they're a lot harder. But are you trying to count push-ups or are you trying to get stronger? That's what I thought. Of course, there are lots of variations on those strength drills and others. For those of you that are advanced with their push-ups, doing handstand push-ups against a wall with, you know, some kind of soft mat under your head and ideally someone to spot you so you can stay safe. It's a great way to build strength in your shoulders and in your back. Now, I bet you can think of half a dozen exercises, at least, that I didn't mention as I talked through some of these strength drills. Be creative, mix it up, but Remember to be safe. And if you're not educated on the body and you don't have someone that, you know, is telling you these drills are safe, at least check them out online. You know, do some research before you're going to do something a thousand times. The last of the three components, cardiovascular fitness. 
We talked a lot about the concept earlier, forced adaptation of the systems responsible for moving oxygen and waste products. To make it simpler, it's about intensity. If you constantly train at a slow or even a moderate pace, you're not going to progress. Your body requires constantly varied and increasingly difficult challenges. That's why I'm not a fan of expecting the same number of repetitions of a movement from everyone in a martial arts class. If you have veteran black belts that are, in theory anyway, in good shape, working side by side with novice students, they shouldn't be doing the same conditioning or strength exercises. We don't expect them to do anything else in class the same way. No, there are levels, and that's why we have belts. I'm not saying that different belts need different structured fitness requirements, though I do know schools that do that. They, ha they have that in their curriculum, and it can be really successful. No, even breaking it up into just a few groups, and you can name them however you want. You know, group one, group two, group three, and let's say group one does 10 push-ups when push-ups are assigned. Group two does 20, and group three does 30. And thousand different ways that you can slice that, but I think you know what I'm saying. In that example, everyone, assuming they're put into the right group, is challenged. They continue to progress. When everyone is given the same work to perform, either the high-end participants aren't getting what they need, or the folks on the other end are being asked to do way too much. And you, at the very least, they're going to be frustrated, but more importantly, they may be risking injury. Some of my favorite drills to condition cardiovascular fitness involve performing kicks in a certain amount of time. How many front kicks can you do in a minute, for example? And then next time, try and beat that score. Now, years ago, I used to track that very score for my students, and the motivation it gave them to improve was tremendous. And though we rarely do it now, writing down that information or, or similar information can be really valuable in a martial arts setting. To know what you were able to do last week, last month, last year, can not only help motivate you for constant improvement, but it can inspire you by showing you how far you've come. How about some other cardiovascular drills? Burpees. Burpees are probably the single best cardio drill for martial artists. If you're not familiar with a burpee, it's sort of like a push-up where you stand up at the top and then you jump and then you go back down. And again, we're all We'll have some videos over on the website for you to check out. Now, the best cardiovascular improvement comes from exercises where it's not your muscular endurance giving out. Like when you're doing push-ups, you usually don't get tired. Your arms just give out, right? But rather, it's where you lose your breath. Jumping movements like jump kicks, often it's, it's the someone's lungs. They lose their wind long before their legs get super tired. And since we talked about it earlier, let's talk about using sparring to build cardiovascular endurance. One of the easiest ways to focus on the conditioning aspects of a match is to make the match simpler. For example, you could make one person the attacker and the other the defender. That way, people can worry a bit less about what it is they're doing and spend more time just doing it. Try going fast for 30 seconds, then swap attackers. I'll almost guarantee a few minutes of this and people will be ready for a break. So how about you? What are your favorite drills for building strength and endurance or increasing flexibility? Leave them over on the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And remember, this is episode 56. You can also find the show notes, including a full transcript from today's episode, as well as photos and videos of the drills we talked about. If you want to give us a shout on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. Username all over the place is Whistlekick. If you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that has some good stories, please fill out the form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up on everything we do. You can learn more about our products at whistlekick.com and our winter hats are finally available online, so check those out. Since you've already listened this far, I know you like the show, so please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out in the future. We bring these shows to you twice a week, and while we love the support of your business, the main thing we ask for is a review. If you're an iPhone user, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review there. If you're listening in some other way, give us a review wherever you're getting your podcast, however that might be, or just leave us some comments over on the, the website. Thank you. So that's all today, and until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.